education foundations the next step the next steps for croydon's skills sector uh so make your choice now um as i say those <coughs> those who wish to remain in this webinar space for our education discussion welcome thank you for thank you for keeping faith well, we've already been talking a fair bit about the importance of uh, of, of skills uh, and and education and training in in Croydon um, adapting to to our post COVID world. It, it has, of course, been a very disrupted few months for all students, whether they're at school, college, or university training courses. And the government has, I think, quite rightly recognised the importance of ensuring that young people's education continues as best as possible during the pandemic. But it is an anxious and difficult time for many, particularly, I think, for that, that younger generation transitioning from school uh, into college, into university and, and into the, the, the workplace. Croydon, of course, has ambitions to become a new university hub, as we've been talking, uh, with London South Bank University due to start courses next year alongside the University of Roehampton and Croydon College. In this session, we will be thinking about the, the next steps for Croydon's skills sector. What should be the focus in the coming years? And what, what skills should we prioritise? We've talked a bit about that already. And how can we strengthen the education sector to ensure that all young people can still achieve their potential despite you know, the, the, the disruption of the virus? We have, of course, a fantastic uh, panel. We have uh, with us this morning, Elisa Fleming, who is the Cabinet Member for Children, Young People and Learning at Croydon Council. Good morning, Elisa. Good morning. We have Michael Simmons, who is the Group Director of Corporate Affairs at London South Bank University. Good morning, Michael. Good morning. And Karen Mitchell, who is CEO and Principal at Croydon College. Good morning, Karen. Good morning. And we also have Professor Jean-Noël Erzingard, who's Vice-Chancellor at the University of Roehampton. Jean-Noël, good morning. Morning, Mark. Welcome to you all and to all those uh, elsewhere in our, in our virtual conference hall. Please, please do use the, the, the Q&A tab to pose your own questions to any of our panel. I'm going I'm to kick us off there with a, really with the same question to to each of you, uh, which is, we've sort of touched it on, on, on already, and, it, and it's how, how Croydon should grab the opportunities that clearly exist, as we've been discussing right now, in terms of the, the skills and educational uh, demands that there are gonna be in our, in our post-COVID world. Uh, Elisa Fleming, do you, want to, do you want to just kick us off? I mean, we've talked about various kinds of FinTech and EdTech and all these kind of things. What are your thoughts as to, as to how, Croydon, how the borough should should respond to the you know to the skills and educational challenges we've got. Yeah, um, thank you, Mark. Uh, it was interesting actually listening to the earlier session, um, and actually your your introduction uh, remarks right at the beginning, and you spoke about building better, um, and that phrase really struck me and the opportunity that both comes with it, uh, not just for actually our young people, but when we were talking in a, in a post kind of pandemic global way, what that means and the real opportunities. Uh, and your comments, particularly around AV um, and the emergence of, uh, you know, those growing markets and technology. And I really think that there are real opportunities for us there um, in, in how we support our young people. I'm always proud to say that Croydon has the largest number of young people in any London borough. We were previously 93,500, but the new stats are up to 123,000 plus um, mm -hmm. and growing. Uh, that's uh, 0 to 18 years old. Um, and of course, so, you know, we've got the, the, the top end and the opportunities that are for our 16 plus um, going into further education um, and indeed our new babies coming up. And at some stage later on, I'll be able to talk to you about the work that we're doing around the best start in life. Um, but kind of bringing back, back to, you know, the opportunities that we have. There are so many, whether it be that we're talking about the opportunities in construction. And actually, I was speaking to some of uh, the, the young people in the wards that I represent, um, but actually this week. Uh, uh, and, you know, there was a real um, desire for them to put themselves forward for training courses so that they would be able to get the correct construction skills that they need to be able to take up those job opportunities. Um, but also in terms of how we're gonna be moving forward um, in some of our key areas that we've got in this borough around health, we've got, uh, you know, Croydon um, um, 
university hospital and the opportunities there that are going to be coming through some of the courses that are going to be delivered via South Bank University um, in terms of how we support our health sector, particularly as well as having one of the largest um, youth um, populations. We also have quite an elderly population in the borough and the support that is going to be needed there. Um, and finally, uh, I guess my, my last reflection would be around the opportunities, not just because we will be going for the borough of culture status, but actually because of the creativity that exists within Croydon. We've got you know, you, you, a number of artists, both um, present and in the past, that have come out of Croydon in terms of the creativity that exists here. And I think that it gives us a real opportunity, even if we are looking at, um, you know, the changes that are going to take place in terms of the business sector and the uses of our shopping centres, etc., to look at what that looks like in terms of the creativity place. Uh, Carrie Mitchell from Croydon College, same question to you really. We've been talking for already this morning quite a lot about the, the sectors that look as though they're likely to grow and, uh, and the sort of changing way in which we're going to be perhaps living and working uh, post-COVID. Um, how, how, how is the college sort of ad ad adapting to, to, to obviously the, the sort of new demands that, uh, that the people have been talking about? Thank you. Um, I, I think what's quite um, interesting is that we have seen a huge surge in uh, the number of uh, people wanting to study at the college this academic year, um, which is fantastic. You know, it means that people are investing in their future despite um, everything that's going on in, in wider society. And we've got nearly 2,716 to 18 year olds with us this year. We've got um, 3,000 adults studying with us. And, and those numbers are continuing to grow. We still have inquiries coming in. And I think as unemployment rises, there's people who are looking for a brighter future um, by investing in their education. So I, I think that's really exciting. I am worried that we don't have quite enough funding and finance to, um, to meet all their needs, but let's see. Um, it's really interesting because the same sectors are coming up in all the conversations we've heard this morning. We've seen a 25% or we've grown our health and social care provision by 25% into this year. We've grown our construction and engineering by 30% into this year. And um, one of the things that hasn't been touched on yet was um, provision for people with special educational needs, which um, supported by the council, we've grown into this year. And we've had a huge expansion in the range of apprenticeships that we're providing and um, taking us into things like pharmacy and um, sites to provision. Um, areas that we hadn't traditionally um, done in the past. I think one of the things that um, we are working really, really hard to do at the college is to make sure that our curriculum, our course offer, the things that we are providing to our students really meet the needs of the um, economy. And, um, and that means that we're having far more quality dialogue with um, employers than we used to have, um, which, which is really exciting, I think, and, and really thinking about how we can meet that and technology needs in the future, the digital needs, and, and we've got small growths in those, those areas into this year to, um, as a start of that. But of course, we've got we've got more, still more work to do. The college has a lot of Zoom calls are being had at the moment. <laughs> yes, yes, a lot. Um, <laughs> the college has a, a really long-held ambition, and um, we've got 160 access to higher education um, uh, students studying nursing. And, um, and uh, I'm delighted to say that in partnership with um, Roehampton, we will be um, offering those the um, opportunity to access a degree in nursing from September uh, 21, which is fantastic. But the bigger thing that I'm more delighted, I'm delighted about with working with the University of Roehampton is the wider opportunities that partnership's going to allow um, for employers in Croydon. Um, we have been already having some discussions with a large employer in Croydon about how we really meet their workforce needs. And of course, that, that's one side of that's employer story. But the other side of that is we have all these individuals in Croydon who need pathways straight into employment. And through our partnership, we're really aiming to, to be able to provide that so that we can meet all the needs of the economy. So that further education and higher education are working hand in hand to, um, to meet that skills agenda um, for the Croydon community for our residents and our employers. So really excited about that partnership and um, 
and let's, what extra we can bring to the community. Yeah, group. well, let, let's talk about that partnership a bit a bit more. Uh, Jean Noël at University of Roehampton. I mean, it, it clearly makes a lot of sense for you to be having Zoom calls with each other on a regular basis. But but what does that partnership uh, actually bring in terms of ensuring that you know that, that the the uh, the educational offer in Croydon reflects the the future demands? So, so I mean. Partnership is, is really a key word here because if you look at, at all good education, and I would, I would uh, echo Karen's uh, point here, what we're about uh, is developing a great offer. Uh, all good education is delivered in partnership. Um, and you know, we need partnership between, uh, uh, between providers and students, uh, between providers and employers, um, and between providers and uh, the civic uh, institutions. Um, and what we're trying to do here is develop that partnership in a way that meets the immediate needs uh, of uh, the local economy uh, and uh, the demand uh, 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 of students. Uh, and with that, that demand is rising. Croydon for us at Roehampton is the second largest borough uh, in terms of intake, um, uh, and it is growing. And this year we've seen yet uh, uh, more growth, uh, as Karen said. So partnership is the key word, but the second key word is capacity. Uh, and in, in order to deliver good education, you need capacity to be ready. Uh, and capacity takes time to build. Um, and that's why uh, the partnership with Croydon College uh, allows both the college and us to bring together, uh, we've got academic capacity, uh, and the college has great academic capacity as well as uh, a, a, brief, a wonderful site uh, in Croydon. And by working together, uh, we're able to immediately address that capacity uh, uh, growth uh, and respond uh, to, to employer demand. We're working in very close partnership uh, with Croydon University Hospital uh, in terms of the provision of placements, for instance, um, uh, and also uh, with, with other employers through the college. So it, it, we, we also got capacity to interact uh, with uh, local needs uh, through that partnership with local uh, with with, uh, with Croydon College. Great, um, Michael uh, Simmons. Um, uh, your your thoughts too, really, on uh, from your <laughs> London University, of course. I mean, your thoughts too on on that big question of the moment, really, of, of how we ensure that we can get the right fit between the young people who are, who are you know, hopefully going to be able to return properly to, uh, to universities and, and enjoy their courses fully without having to do too many of them online uh, in, in the next year or two, and ensure that when they emerge from that process, you know, they're absolutely you know, box ready for the jobs which are going to be there for them. I'd echo everything that's been said already, but on, on that particular Point. I think it, it is about close working relationships with employers and with uh, local council and, and, and government broad, more broadly. There's, there's been a lot uh, said about investment in, for example, the green economy. And what we have to do is to look at the, uh, the jobs that are available or going to, going to be available, the funding that's available. And, and those young people and indeed older learners, um, you mustn't forget that uh, there's, a, there's a huge potential for upskilling and, if you like, cross-skilling uh, people who are having to change jobs or simply want to change jobs. So we have to line those things up. And in some cases, it's quite complicated. So a lot of the green jobs that people talk about will be quite different and will involve a, uh, a different ranges of skills and, and, uh, and we'll have to work out how those juxtapose, talk to the employers and then present real career pathways for young people so that they can see a line of sight from where they are to where they want to get to without worrying too much about, uh, so we can help them through that pathway rather than them having to worry on their own about well, what qualification do I need to do to get to that? So a lot of it is about some quite granular work on what are the jobs, what are the skills that they need and what are the pathways that will take people from where they are to where they want to be. Yeah, it'd be useful perhaps if you could just sort of lay out what London South Bank's sort of ambitions in Croydon are. I mean, what are your links with the, with the borough? So you know, our, our starting point is very much around around that. Look at what's needed. It's it's long been identified as an area that's been underserved from a higher education perspective, and so that, and that was the reason that we we were keen to 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 open the campus there. Um, one of the, the key areas of employment in the, in the borough. And, and around is health and social care. Um, and obviously there's, there's some provision there already, 
but um, going back to something that was said earlier on, uh, this question of capacity, what, what the campus enables us to do is to, to dramatically increase that capacity so that there's an opportunity locally for local people to get those local jobs, which obviously benefits them and the wider community that those health providers serve. So that's really the starting point for us. Um, we've been asked about you know, drawing more people into the borough uh, for higher education, and that is clearly a, a longer term objective. But in the short term, we really want to serve local people uh, and local employers. And as I say, that's pr principally around health and social care, but also our businesses. Um, the university has a substantial enterprise offer um, with a large provider of, 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 of business support uh, funded by um, European Union funding. Yeah. And um, there's a real opportunity there to, to help, especially at this time, to help small businesses open and existing businesses to grow and indeed adapt their offers. So part of it will be around very much around upskilling people into work, but also I think helping employers to, um, to, to adjust to what will be a, a reshaped economy. Uh, Elisa Fleming, I, I mean, sort of what, what emerges from what we've heard is, is, I think, an ambition to turn Croydon into you know, a real magnet for, uh, for, for, for students and young people to come and study in, in, in the borough. Um, uh, Michael was sort of just saying there that, uh, you know, that's, that's perhaps a bit further down the track. But can you perhaps just give us an, a, an idea of in, in your head? Where might we be in five years' time in terms of Croydon as a, you know, sort of a recognised further and higher education centre? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I mean, what, what I would say is that I think it is key, um, Michael's uh, reflections about the importance of ensuring that we are uh, serving um, our local residents that are here first and foremost, but equally at the same time, that real opportunity to become that hub, um, that kind of central point and melting pot, as it were, um, for so many other residents, both not just, um, you know, out, outside of Croydon, but also internationally to build on that um, and for more, more residents to be able to come in. Uh, some of that is linked to some of the earlier discussions that we had about regeneration in the town um, and making sure uh, you know we can act as uh, almost as hubs whether it be that we ha we have more businesses that are working and operating locally or whether it's that particularly with our transport links into um straight straight into london in you know, a 15 minutes to victoria from east croydon train station that we we, we um take uh, advantage of those opportunities um, but that pathway link piece is, is what I see in terms of that five years that we've got clear pathways for our young people that they know how they can access some of the courses that they want to um, undertake in terms of uh, a further education, but also opportunities for retraining and upskill, upskilling for um, our older, uh, you know, members of, uh, of, of the borough. I mean, for, for myself, born and bred in Croydon, when I went to university, you know, the first time there, there wasn't an option to, to, to study within, within the borough past, um, uh, past 16, uh, I mean, past college rather, um, post 18. Um, and, you know, we had to travel out Leicester, Coventry, et cetera. Um, and then returning as a mature student, and actually I studied at Croydon College, um, and was able to uh, undertake and, and complete my law degree there. And that was really important to be able to do it on the doorstep and at the same time be able to work um, and access employment. And I think that our hub will, uh, our, our campus will deliver that. It will give young people the opportunity and also older residents to do both. Some may still choose to go outside of the borough for that experience of living away from home, but an opportunity to both work and play, as it were, within your hometown, I think is really important. And yeah. I think that we will see more residents that will come from abroad um, to come over and uh, take advantage of the opportunities that are here. And, and that, I suppose, is the, in a way, is the, is the great prize. Um, uh, anonymous attendee, um, a shame that they're anonymous, given the, the comments that they've made, but uh, Croydon should do a bigger deal with Roehampton St Mary's South Bank to bring a student population in Croydon. How can we, how can we stop leaking talent in the form of students, entrepreneurs, 
and families fleeing from Croydon's brand and incompetent leadership. Well, let's leave the last point. But I do, I do wonder about um, how, I mean, actually there is a, if you are going to attract people from elsewhere in the country, you say, I'm going to go and I'm going to go and study in Croydon. I'm going to take, you know, my student grant to Croydon and spend my money in the local shops and, uh, and, and go and, and, you know, get my skills and, uh, and, and training and experience there. Um, that, that requires, does it not, a decision by the, by the borough to say we're going to make this really an attractive place for that student. You mentioned that you've got a very young population already. It's going to, it's, it's going to require you to, to actually be quite sort of proactive in creating a really attractive student environment. How high up your priority list is that? Yeah, it, it's high on the list. I, I, I would point to um, a, a campaign that we ran, which, which came out of a, a, a session that we held um, an annual youth conference with young people in the borough and every school and every college was represented. Um, and we asked young people to choose for themselves. And we had a campaign, an award-winning campaign called Choose Your Future, which asks young people um, what it is that they want. And one of the things that they spoke about included the town centre, regeneration, but high up on their um, agenda amongst safety was also education. Um, and I think that the first step has been and is to actually make an offer available. There wasn't the offer, as I, as I alluded to before, in terms of uh, that higher education piece. So really putting that more on the table. Croydon College was there, but in terms of creating the, you know, uh, that bigger campus is been the first step. Secondly, I think it is going to be, particularly in a post-COVID world, about thinking about how we can do it in a creative way. And that, again, my comments that I alluded to earlier on when I, when I spoke about our borough of culture um, opportunities that come there, because the, the, the traditional um, kind of university campus setup is not what Croydon is and all we'll, we'll will lend itself to, there is space and there are, there are considerations to how we, we could develop a campus, particularly in terms of accommodation, except for, for young people. But I think that very much um, the development of, of, of the complex within Croydon will lend itself to a different uh, variation of students. Those that are looking for both that traditional approach to um, uh, further education, but also for those young people who want to do it kind of differently and outside of the box. Um, mm. and, and I just do think that that is an opportunity is going to be about, we do need to make sure that there is uh, things for our young people to do outside of the, not, not, not that I'm alluding to both um, Jean or Michael or, or Corinne that we don't want the students to just study, um, but there is the social element that goes with it. Um, and I, I think that that is gonna be a key part of the agenda yeah. moving forward. I like Karen, but I'd like to bring you in on on, on this. I mean that that that. Uh, I mean, obviously, you want to do both. Obviously, you want to provide for uh, for, for local residents to have a, a, a really great educational opportunity on their doorstep if that's what they wish to do. And also, uh, there are clearly opportunities for Croydon to expand its offer and encourage more young people to to come to the borough to to to, to get their education. But it is going to require, uh, just as Elisa was saying, it is going to require uh, the right accommodation. It's going to require the right, the, the right, uh, uh, you know, opportunity for leisure and uh, and that kind of thing. Do you get a sense that you know, the partnerships that you've already alluded to? Are, are on the same page in terms of trying to expand the offer that is going to perhaps a, a, a attract people from you know right across the UK and beyond? Um, I, th I think that's a very interesting question. I, I, I think one of the things I, I would I would step slightly further back than that um, to, to start to answer your question. And one of the trends that we are picking up now is a decline in the number of students, um, our students, um, who are applying to go to university. Now that could be the pandemic, it could be um, some uh, rhetoric around some of the um, uh, university qualifications not paying in the end or, or, or not making sufficient work progress but we're seeing that decline in our students and I think one of the really important things that um, in our partnership with Roehampton has to be able to do is to provide those alternatives as well so rather than 
uh, young people having to commit to that big degree about and going out of borough and accessing that and the travel or the living away from home. How do we get more of those local people who are choosing not to go to university through the education system? How do we make sure they progress after level three into that level four, into that level five, and potentially topping up to degree level where, where that's a suitable um, point for them? So there's something really important about that. And, and the other part, of course, is that uh, we are struggling more with apprenticeships in, in the COVID world. Um, and so we need to be able to provide that other opportunity for, for our local residents, first of all. I, th I think, yes, it would be great if we um, were able to bring Croydon back to life in the town centre by, by having a, a, um, an intake of students. But how do we keep our, our own ones first and how do we make sure that they can make the progress that we need them to do? Um, to get into those skilled jobs in Croydon. We don't want, I mean, I don't mean this um, in a bad way, but we don't want to see all those commuters coming into Croydon every day on the train when we've got local people who could be taking those jobs with those big employers. So I think it, the onus in us, first of all, is to serve the uh, Croydon residents and the Croydon employers. And, and if that then allows us to build that business and, and have people coming into Croydon to access that, then fantastic. Okay. Uh, Jean-Noël, sort of, I'm interested in what Karen was saying about the sort of focus on the local first and ensuring that, uh, you know, that people, people stay and they do feel there's an opportunity on their doorstep. You know, your uh, relationship now uh, with the, uh, with the borough, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I, are you, are you seeing this as an opportunity to support local people in Croydon or are you in it as it were, because you want to, you see Croydon as a, a, a place that could be a much bigger um, center for, for, for education, attracting people from a much wider area. So, so, so let me pick up your, your last point first. Croydon will become bigger uh, as a center for education. If you look at the demographics, uh, if you look at uh, uh, the, the demographics of, of business as well as uh, the, the, the demographics of, of, of births and young people, Croydon will become bigger. There's no doubt about that. So, so let's take that for granted. But, but I think if you look at it in terms of, of our partnership with Croydon College, it's very much built around serving a, a need which is currently not served uh, in, in the borough. So just give you an example. This year, we, we opened uh, very discreetly uh, a study centre together with Croydon College. Um, and, and it's based in the college and it's open only for uh, students who are uh, registered uh, at Roehampton. And the reason we did this is because we thought that there might be students who would be um, uh, worried about traveling because of the pandemic. Uh, and actually that's not, it, the, the, the demand is, is of course that, but of the, the demand is also students who want to stay local, who want to study, uh, uh, not far from home, uh, they may have caring responsibilities, they may have uh, jobs uh, that make it difficult for them to travel to university uh, uh, further afield in London. Uh, and, and increasingly we're seeing that the, 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 the model we have of, of a university student uh, is, is changing. Uh, and it, it is uh, a, a, a demand that's building that we need to respond to. Uh, and if we respond to that demand, that will create uh, economic growth as well as uh, a social progress uh, in the borough. And I wouldn't be worried about uh, skills uh, leaking out uh, of the borough. The, the evidence nationally is that more provision of higher education keeps uh, skills where they have been developed. Uh, and students tend to stay where they have studied when they graduate. Um, uh, in, in, in great proportions. Uh, so by building that supply of skilled young people or skilled or, or reskilled uh, older people, um, uh, that will also provide uh, a, a, a great uh, pool uh, of talent for, uh, uh, for, for, for the local community. Mm. Uh, Fintan O'Toole, um, you may remember from Startup Croydon, has, uh, has put another question, which I, I, I'll put to you, Jean-Noël. It, um, so at Startup Croydon, we're keen to keep our support relevant and in step with the changing needs of business startups. What do the panel believe are the key skills and support that those looking to start their own businesses in the borough will need, particularly those who may have recently lost their jobs and are looking uh, to start up on their own? I mean, I guess this is 
this is going to be a very real and very pressing, very urgent uh, need for, 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 for young people in, in Croydon, all over the place, but certainly in the borough. Um, is that something that you're aware of at the University of Roehampton? Very, very much so. Um, and uh, I mean, this is um, th this this is something that all uh, all education providers, whether it's universities or, or further education colleges, uh, are, are very much working on at the moment. Uh, there are many partnerships developing. Uh, there are ideas uh, in in the pot that, that we're working on. Um, it, it, the, the the key. Um, is that when um, entrepreneurs access support, uh, their businesses tend to survive longer, uh, their businesses uh, tend to uh, grow faster. Uh, so what we want to, to do uh, and where we want to be is, is at the sort of the, the, the support end uh, of business creation. Um, and, and that support can be uh, can be low touch, uh, or, or it can be uh, much greater uh, uh, through uh, a, a longer period of support uh, that's connected, say, with uh, research projects in, in universities. So there's a whole spectrum of support that, that can be accessed. But the key is that where uh, new businesses access support, where they access knowledge uh, in uh, in universities and elsewhere. Uh, they tend to do better. Okay, um, Michael Simmons, there's a question on the um, on the Q and A uh, button, which I think you might be able to help with. How do the three universities intend to work in partnership to ensure that the needs of local people are met, and there isn't an oversupply of courses in one area and an undersupply in other areas? So that is going to require all those involved in the partnerships, isn't it, to make sure that uh, you know they're in tune with each other. You're not uh, either doing too much of one thing or not enough of another. Well, I think it's fair to say that the, the, the institutions have, have different strengths uh, and, and we'll all seek to play for those that then there may be some overlap. But indeed, I think one of the key, the key points is it's not, as was being alluded to earlier, it's about adjusting to the student, the changes in the student body. So, for example, uh, whilst the college runs uh, business courses, as does the university, um, the two business courses that we're, we're launching, with, we're, we're seeking to deliver over two years. So it's, it's a different kind of provision um, and that will apply in other areas as well. Again, the, the college does work in construction, uh, principally around uh, level four. Um, the university does a lot more at level five and six in, in that area. So again, it's, it's seeking to build those, those, those pathways. Um, again, in terms of variety of provision, um, we've got, we, we, we teach around 2000 higher degree apprenticeships. Uh, a lot of those are in construction. And so, again, uh, it's not just about do the courses, are the courses or the subject areas the same? It's actually is the provision, the style of provision different. And I think that's that's one of the key areas that we'll, we'll, we'll seek to look at together is, 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 is making sure that all the increasingly varied student body is served in different ways. And, and how do you view... Uh, Croydon. I mean, do you think that people who who come to study in Croydon will uh, will will, live, will still live at home, perhaps with their with their their parents? I.e., the journey is not that far. Or do you think there will be a significant proportion who will uh, you know come from from far enough away that it's worth them you know renting a flat or or or, or trying to get some kind of other accommodation locally? I think it will change. Uh, I think initially we'd anticipate. And most of the most of the, the student body kept being relatively local. There's good transport links, but as the as the provision grows, uh, we'd anticipate uh, the need for some some purpose built student accommodation to serve that demand both from the UK and from overseas. Um, Alisa, I'd like to get your thoughts on this, actually, because I know that you know, for a lot of people in the construction side and the development side, they'll be thinking, you know, are there opportunities with the uh, obvious expansion that we've been talking about in, in, in education in the borough for student accommodation, which would obviously you know, change the character of the place uh, to some extent. What, what, what are your sort of ambitions in that area? I mean, it, it's most certainly something that we have uh, considered and, and thought about even at this early stage. Um, uh, and, and, and I think 
just kind of in line with the with, with the last comments that there will come a time and and hopefully sooner rather than later where um that need will present itself um and so in terms of some of the future planning and what we we, we look at um both as a council but also as a cabinet it is a reflection that we have um in the back of our minds as it were about making sure that there is space available and and again, earlier on, I, I alluded to some of those conversations about where is their space sufficient and big enough to be able to deliver that in the borough um, versus uh, smaller um, plots within within the town centre that might lend themselves more comfort, comfort, uh, comfortably to um, delivering that. But I, I, I think the fact that we've got good transport links across the borough helps with that. And the, the only thing that I would add to it in terms of the need, and it's slightly outside of, or, or of your question, um, but I, I really think it's important that we, um, one of the ambitions that I hold personally, but I, I, I know sits with, with the borough as a whole, um, and indeed, um, you know, everybody in, 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 in the, most of the panellists, at least I know within um, this chat is around how we support more of our care leavers to be able to access higher education. Um, uh, we, we, we said we touched on, but we didn't really go into much detail about, uh, I would like to see more of um, support for some of our young people with special educational needs or, or indeed additional needs um, to be able to access employment. Um, and so that jobs and skills training around that agenda is going to be really important. Um, and, and, you know, factoring that into what it is that we would be delivering in terms of uh, accommodation or, or options for those young people to make sure that they're I'll safe and secure. That, I'll, I'll put that thought to, to our, our, our three providers in, in a moment. There is, there is a question from, um, again, anonymous attendee. Gosh, this person is really going for it this morning. <laughs> what role can the council play to encourage good partnership working? Does Councillor Fleming fully understand what the existing offer is to ensure they are talking to the right sort of potential new education partners. Um, you know, we've talked a lot about partnership. Um, I, obviously, we've got three very significant partners in our virtual uh, panel this morning, but uh, uh, there's a question for you. Are you, are you confident yeah. that you're talking to the right sort of people? Yes. Uh, you know, again, um, to our anonymous um, person, thank you for the, the question. I guess what I would say is that these conversations have been taking place behind the scenes for a number of years. Um, and we have met with a number of providers to look at what the best fit is for Croydon and to ensure that the courses that are going to be in this borough meet the needs, the existing needs of the residents live here and, and indeed of the emerging um, jobs market. Um, and, and so when we're looking at which partnerships you're going to put together, those are some of the conversations that take place. Um, and what we have at the moment are free providers who are both first and foremost committed to em empowering the residents that live within this borough and the young people um, and, and, and indeed others that live here, but also working collectively together, recognising, uh, as was mentioned earlier, that each provider brings different skills. Um, and as that creative campus grows, it will be very much in, in line with that um, agenda that, you know, the, the variance is, is, is what gives the creative campus its strength and its skill. And that's what true partnership working uh, looks like. It's not about, um, you know, this person is better than this person. It's about what does everybody bring to the table and merging that together that's how you get that that, that collective good um, you know and, and outcomes because ultimately that's what we want which is increased uh, access into higher education and as a result increased access into the job market and increased um, input into our borough um, in, in, in terms of jobs and skills and, 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 and economy well economic welfare. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, Karen, I, I, I would like to sort of pick up the, the, the point that Elisa was making about special educational needs and indeed uh, young people who've left the care sector who we know are you know, particularly vulnerable and can often fall through the, the, the cracks. What efforts do, do you make at Croydon College to, uh, you know, to, to make sure that you, that, that you are a supportive environment to groups like that? 
Yeah, I mean, it's one of the areas of work that we're most proud of at uh, Croydon College. We uh, don't just have our, our student support team sitting on the edges waiting to pick up students for it who are in trouble. You know, our, our, our staff, you know, really care about students and they're aware of who, um, who has additional needs. They're aware of who um, is a looked after child. And um, it's something we've um, probably got uh, good at over the years and um, just due to the sheer number of looked after children we have in our building. Um, particularly at the Croydon campus because we've got the home office um, nearby. Um, I, I think there is an ongoing issue for uh, care leavers in terms of their aspirations and how we better support them to get um, to progress in life. And, and um, I know that it's one of the things that we want to be working with um, Roehampton on in the future is how do you develop those pathways? How do you make education for those people who might be looking at it for the very first generation who might not have thought about it as, as a possible pathway for, for them. Um, we've got a, a fantastic student I was speaking to earlier uh, uh, last week who um, sent us this uh, message who had started at entry level ESOL with us and is just finishing their, um, their degree in early year studies. And, um, and, you know, and, and spoke no English at the point that they started with us and we supported them all the way. Um, and I think it's really important that that right from those early, um, you know, low, lower level studies, we're, we're talking to students about their aspirations and their potential and what they can achieve. You know, nothing makes me prouder than I go into an entry level ESOL class and there's guys talking about being engineers or, or you know, women talking about being engineers. It, it's really important that, that we begin those work related discussions really early, those aspirational discussions really early. And that we do that throughout people's um, time at the college. Um, yeah. And I'm really hoping that, um, you know, as our partnership with Roehampton deepens and widens, um, that will provide even more opportunities for those students. Yeah, and it's really important, as you say, that we celebrate those those absolutely inspirational stories, too, because it encourages others. Um, Jean-Noël, I'd, I'd be interested to know your sort of... Uh, I mean, that generation, my, my, my children's generation, the ones who are in transition at the moment, I mean, this is really a, a very anxiety-making uh, moment for them all. And obviously those who got, you know, as we've been discussing, special educational needs, perhaps English is not their first language, maybe they, they've come out of a, 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 the care sector. I mean, absolutely, the, the, the sector has a massive, massive responsibility does it not right now to make sure that that whether it's Croydon or anywhere else that you know that that, that that pathway can be found through to to to, to good jobs at the end of it this is this is spot on and I mean that's exactly why we we want to work with Croydon College because we know that when you provide higher education teaching is one thing uh, but actually a, a lot of it is also about the support you provide students uh, and, and that support is pastoral uh, as much as it is educational. Um, uh, and, and pastoral support ranges from uh, the, the ability to provide uh, uh, someone to have chats uh, uh, on a sort of a tutorial basis uh, uh, through to uh, access to, uh, to, to resources, uh, which are not just library resources, but can be a specialist support, a mental health support uh, in, in particular. Uh, and, and that takes a lot of infrastructure uh, to, to build. Uh, and, and when you enter a new location as a university, and, and, and uh, you know, th th this is a, a question that everybody in the sector is asking themselves, making sure that that capacity uh, is there uh, is critical because uh, it, it, you know, it's not just care leavers, it, it's, it, it's increasingly the, 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 a broad range of, of students who uh, don't have the family networks that uh, 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 traditional students might, might have. Uh, they, they are, a lot of them will be first in generation to, to access higher education. Uh, a lot of them uh, as well, Jean Well, that you know, for a lot of a lot of young people, uh, lockdown, the anxiety that uh, that all this dislocation brings means that there's going to be a huge sort of mental well-being challenge for for all uh, institutions in education. That, that absolutely, uh, and I mean, what what we are actually finding is uh, 
the, the way we're teaching at the moment uh, seems to work for a lot of our students, non-traditional students, uh, this ability to access learning uh, remotely as well as face-to-face. -face. It's a positive um, in that. You don't see that just as a negative. You, you see that as an opportunity. Engagement has gone up uh, over lockdown. Uh, engagement attendance uh, at uh, classes, uh, virtual classes has gone up. Uh, and I was struck by, uh, we, we have a, a, a meeting with students uh, regularly, and I was struck by one of them telling me uh, about two weeks into lockdown, I've now, I'm now able to attend lectures that I couldn't attend in the past because I have a job in the NHS, she's a pharmacist, um, and uh, I, I couldn't attend uh, at those lectures uh, because she also has two kids uh, and uh, is the sole provider uh, in, uh, in her household. Um, so juggling all of that uh, is very, very difficult. And if you provide more flexible access routes, uh, that, that helps um, with well-being. Yeah. My, Michael Simmons, we're, we're coming towards the end of our, our, our session, but just really a final thought from you on the challenge ahead. I mean, clearly, as we've been discussing, that generation uh, who are you know, leaving school, going to college, going to university or trying to you know, get their first job. I mean, they have been really dealt a very difficult hand by COVID. Uh, and I wonder how you see the responsibility of the of the sector generally, but particularly thinking about, you know, the the, uh, the, the offer in, in Croydon. So there's no doubt that they've had a very difficult time. Uh, my daughter started at uh, university in uh, in September, so I, I, I'm seeing this from from both sides, if you like. And what's 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 very evident is that we have a real responsibility to provide this kind of support that that's been discussed, but also uh, to, to communicate uh, perhaps in a, in a in a more proactive way than than, than the sector has in the in the past. I think I think as a as a sector we're learning a lot. But I think there are a lot of positives to come out of it in terms of the more flexible provision, more flexible access routes, um, and as I say, uh, perhaps better listening to, 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 the, to, to the, the worries of, of students. They certainly will need more support. And I think you know, LSBU, like, like other institutions, will continue to provide, for example, careers advice past graduation, as we do now. So that when they when they finish, when they graduate, they aren't just left to fend for themselves. We'll continue to look after them as they become alumni and, and, and move on to their careers. OK, thank you. Uh, well, we've sadly come to the end of our time for this session. If you have any burning questions that you haven't have answered so far, and I can see a, a couple on sustainability, interestingly, that popped in just at the end of our discussion. Um, uh, please do go to the Q&A tab, put your thoughts in there. I'm sure the panelists will do their best to, to answer any that, <laughs> that they find there. But for the moment, though, a huge thank you to Elisa, Michael, Kareen and uh, Jean Noel. Thank you very much indeed.